I hope you do. I want to celebrate. I bought you a present. I want to celebrate too. Friggin' trust me. <laughs> Just don't get all funny after the job. Yeah, I'll try. Fresh you makes the calm me. <laughs> Finish this job and move on. Just let the future be better. I think we have sex tomorrow night. I don't know. It depends if we're celebrating or not. This unsettling phone call took place in March 2016, revealing a chilling conversation between two lovers driven to madness. They were plotting the murder of her ex-husband. In Bianca's twisted mind, her motive was clear. Through a web of lies and sexual manipulation, she coerced her new husband into becoming her personal assassin. Tragically, their plans did not unfold as intended, and the fallout devastated not one, but three families. But who was this woman? What did she do to earn the notorious title of Melbourne's Black Widow? And how did she manage to evade justice for so many years? Michael Kaposiena was born on May 30th, 1977. His mother, Socorsa Kaposiena, had three daughters as well, Maria, Teresa, and Sandra. There are no known details about Michael's biological father or his exact birthplace, though it is believed to be Australia. Michael's childhood and youth remain largely unknown until a significant event in 2006 brought him into the public eye. That year, following a severe car accident, Michael received a monetary compensation from the Transportation Accidents Commission. Using this money, Michael bought a house north of Melbourne. Around this time, Michael was a handsome, muscular, and sociable bachelor in his early 30s. For the next five years, finding a life partner eluded him. However, in early 2012, he met Bianca Edmonds. Bianca, born in 1986, was the daughter of Ellen Edmonds, a devoted mother to her and her sister. Bianca, confident and beautiful, had worked in retail and later as a dental nurse. She had no criminal record. Michael and Bianca's romance progressed quickly, leading to a marriage proposal and Bianca becoming pregnant with their first child. However, their relationship faced difficulties, which Bianca attributed to Michael's abusive and violent behavior. Consequently, their relationship ended just before their engagement party. Shortly after their tumultuous breakup, in February 2013, Michael began dating another woman. Meanwhile, Bianca gave birth to their son, Lucas, on June 3, 2013. Despite their strained relationship, Michael eventually decided he wanted to be part of his son's life. In March 2014, when Lucas was nine months old, Michael sought custody rights leading to a fierce legal battle. During this period, Bianca started a new relationship with Glenn Cassidy, a man 20 years her senior, born on February 16, 1967. Glenn, the son of Marie Cassidy, had previously been married to Janet Cassidy for 20 years, with whom he had three children. Glenn, a heavy machinery operator in Shepparton, north of Victoria, had a simple lifestyle and minimal formal education. He valued his rural upbringing and maintained a close friendship with Paul. Bianca's relationship with Glenn flourished, and they moved to Rochester. Concurrently, in April 2015, Michael moved in with his girlfriend in West Meadows. A month later, Bianca and Glenn decided to settle in Glenn's house in Shepparton, along with Bianca's son, Lucas. Glenn had developed a strong bond with Lucas and felt it was his duty to protect him from Michael. Despite Bianca's intense anger and desire to keep Lucas away from Michael, the court ordered supervised visits for Michael starting in late August 2015. These visits were to be two hours long, every 15 days, at a family support organization in Melbourne. 
This arrangement, requiring long trips for Bianca, exacerbated her frustration. As the visitation schedule began, Bianca's anger grew, often expressing her resentment to her sister. She was not only against Michael's involvement in Lucas's life, but also deeply irritated by the court-ordered visits and the frequent trips to Melbourne. According to Bianca, Michael was obstructing her lifestyle. She began pressuring Glenn to intimidate her ex-boyfriend to make him give up on the custody battle. Glenn, usually a calm man, disagreed with this idea, leading to frequent arguments between them. Seeking solace and a break from the tension, Glenn often visited his friend Paul to vent about his situation. Despite the conflict, Glenn's love for Bianca remained as strong as ever, and he felt an intense need to please her. Bianca knew how to exploit Glenn's devotion and began pushing his limits without him realizing it. Her desire for revenge against Michael drove her to manipulate Glenn, mocking his reluctance to follow her orders and questioning his worth as a man. Paul became well aware of the turmoil in Glenn's relationship, often hearing about it directly from Glenn or through recordings of their conversations. For reasons unknown, Glenn had installed an app on his phone to record their exchanges. Many recorded conversations revealed Glenn's desperate attempts to seek affection from Bianca, including suggesting he get a pink butterfly tattoo over an old one she disliked. Bianca, however, responded evasively to his displays of affection, as her true focus was on eliminating Michael. She openly discussed her plans, even mentioning them to her mother-in-law. Bianca also devised schemes to benefit from Michael's death intending to make a legal claim on his estate in Lucas's name. Although authorities could not prove it later, it is believed that Bianca once asked an anonymous motorcyclist to carry out an attack on Michael. Nonetheless, her main strategy relied on Glenn. In December 2015, while others were making holiday plans, Glenn added an unusual task to his list, pleasing Bianca by eliminating Michael. His list included not only relationship goals, but also items needed for their plan, from tools to weapons. Bianca drew a detailed map of Michael's neighborhood, highlighting security lights and barking dogs. She also provided Glenn with a firearm. Ready to act, Glenn and Bianca married on Saturday, February 27, 2016, but skipped the honeymoon due to work commitments. Glenn used his trips to Melbourne, to familiarize himself with Michael's neighborhood and routines. During these trips, Glenn and Bianca communicated in coded language about their plan, discussing when and how it would happen. Despite several attempts, Glenn's efforts to execute the plan failed, causing Bianca to grow increasingly frustrated and convinced of his incompetence. Determined to achieve her goal, Bianca pressured Glenn by threatening to leave him if he failed. When Glenn inquired about their intimacy, Bianca coldly replied that it depended on him giving her reasons to celebrate. Glenn's complaints about insomnia added to her worries, fearing it would hinder his actions. In mid-March 2016, a court decision exacerbated Bianca's bitterness. The Supreme Court of Victoria informed Michael and Bianca that they alone were responsible for making arrangements for Lucas from then on. The court ruling seemed to mark a turning point for Bianca. In the early hours of Saturday, March 12, 2016, she sent herself a message from Glenn's phone, stating that he loved her, but asked for forgiveness for what he was about to do. He hoped that if he got caught, people would understand she had nothing to do with his actions. Later that day, Glenn got into a blue vehicle, armed with the firearm Bianca had given him, and headed towards Melbourne. An hour and a half later, traffic cameras captured Glenn on his way. At around 7 p.m., Michael and his girlfriend returned home and began preparing dinner. After driving approximately 100 miles, Glenn reached his destination. Before getting out of the vehicle, he sampled some chicken and peas he had brought along. At approximately 7.18 p.m., Michael's girlfriend saw Glenn walking on the opposite side of the street and immediately recognized him from the custody battle for Lucas. She alerted Michael. Surveillance cameras captured Glenn's movements as he hurried back to the car to retrieve the weapon hidden in a white bag. 
Initially, Michael thought his girlfriend was overreacting due to the stressful events of the past months and dismissed her warning. Nine minutes later, cameras recorded Glenn again, now visibly carrying the bag. Alerted once more by his girlfriend, Michael finally spotted Glenn approaching the house. Despite his girlfriend's plea to contact the authorities, Michael decided not to worry and grabbed a kitchen knife for protection. Moments later, there was a knock at the front door. Michael approached cautiously, hiding his weapon. He opened the outer gate but kept the security door locked. The two men exchanged a few words and shook hands. The exact sequence of events in those few seconds remains unclear, especially as Michael's girlfriend, terrified, turned away from the scene. Authorities believe Glenn pushed Michael and, while holding his right hand, aimed the gun at his head. Michael, with his quick reflexes, managed to stab Glenn with the knife just as the gunshot shattered the neighborhood's silence. Michael collapsed, and his girlfriend rushed to his side, calling for help, unaware that Glenn aimed the gun at her too. Fortunately for her, Glenn only had one bullet, which he had used on Michael. Amid the chaos, Glenn forced his way inside and attacked Michael's girlfriend with all his remaining strength. However, weakened by his injury, Glenn was soon overpowered by neighbors alerted by the girl's screams. They surrounded Glenn and urged the young lady to seek safety inside the house. Back inside, she tried desperately to revive Michael with CPR, screaming for help until her voice nearly gave out. When the police arrived, Glenn, before succumbing to his injuries, told the officers that Michael's girlfriend had stabbed him. Consequently, she became a suspect and was taken to the hospital for treatment. Meanwhile, miles away from the crime scene, Bianca received a call from the police. The news was bittersweet. While she had been anxiously awaiting such an outcome, she was now suddenly widowed and no longer had to share custody of Lucas. Before moving Michael and Glenn's bodies to the morgue, detectives found Glenn's phone and a hand-drawn map in his pocket, pointing directly to Michael's home. The night following the tragic events, Likely tormented by the catastrophic outcome of her plan, Bianca confessed to her mother that everything had spiraled out of control because of her. She forwarded the text message that Glenn had supposedly sent her earlier that morning. To make her alibi more convincing, she later did the same with her mother-in-law. However, no one knew Glenn's way of expressing himself better than his own mother, and she noticed that the message had perfect grammar, unlike Glenn's usual style. Although Bianca was the mastermind behind the plan, the police initially found no substantial evidence indicating Glenn had an accomplice. When they tried to retrieve records from his phone, they discovered a series of recorded conversations, but all attempts to access them failed. Four days after the crime, Michael's girlfriend was discharged from the hospital. She had miraculously survived, but now faced the emotional trauma of losing the man she hoped to marry. By then, the authorities had ruled her out as a suspect, leaving her to grapple with the horror of what she had witnessed. As the investigation continued, the detectives were clear about Glenn's role, but still questioned whether his wife's motivations were behind the attack. An initial interview with Bianca yielded no significant insights, leaving the team to rely on the passage of time. In December 2016, Bianca was interrogated again. Despite her repeated claims of innocence and in stating she was at her home on the day of the crime, the detective persisted with relentless determination. Without clear evidence against her, Bianca continued with her life, confident that things would turn out in her favor. She even started a new romantic relationship, although the identity of her new partner remained undisclosed. Later during the investigation, it was revealed that she had mentioned Glenn's difficulties with writing well to her new boyfriend. As months passed, both Michael's and Glenn's families were convinced that Bianca had orchestrated the double crime, despite her apparent indifference to their accusations. Bianca openly criticized what she saw as a clumsy police investigation, and by the start of 2018, it seemed time was on her side. However, around the same time, the investigation made significant progress. With new technology, detectives finally accessed Glenn's recorded calls 
and were shocked by how incriminating the conversations were. Bianca's fingerprint was found on the hand-drawn map, and forensic analysis revealed her DNA on the firearm used by Glenn. Consequently, on April 4, 2018, Bianca faced another interrogation with the police. Confronted with the evidence, she continued to deny any involvement. Despite the severity of the officer's accusations, Bianca always had a counter-argument. Her strategy worked for a while as investigators, determined to build a solid case, decided to let her go. But the authorities didn't drop their vigilance. In June 2019, after an exhaustive police investigation, Bianca was arrested and charged with murder. However, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and Australia's strict precautionary measures played in her favor. After spending months in custody, Bianca was granted bail on May 19, 2020. The court order stated she had met the necessary conditions for bail and she was allowed to travel between states to spend time with her son. Bianca's trial began on May 24, 2022 at the Supreme Court of Victoria. After a month, the jury could not reach a unanimous verdict, causing the trial to fail. Consequently, a second trial was scheduled for early August of the same year. Near the end of the month, the judge accepted the defense's request to dismiss the new jury. Thus, on November 22, 2022, Bianca returned to the Supreme Court of Victoria for her third trial. In his opening statements, the prosecutor asserted that despite the accused's persistent claims of innocence, the families of both men had no doubt that she had manipulated Glenn into attacking Michael. Bianca's defense attorney countered that his client had clearly and repeatedly explained to the authorities how her fingerprints and DNA ended up on the incriminating items. When the prosecutor referenced the conversation between Bianca and her mother on the night following the crime, the defense assured the jury that it never happened. The prosecution argued that Glenn's literacy level would have prevented him from composing a text message as coherent as the one sent hours before the crime. Witnesses testified that Glenn's writing was typically short and riddled with spelling errors, unlike the message in question. Finally, on Saturday, December 17, 2022, the 12-person jury of the Supreme Court of Victoria unanimously found Bianca guilty. The sentencing hearing took place on October 3, 2023, seven years after the crime. In a rare scene, the families of Glenn and Michael sat near each other while Bianca remained almost expressionless. During the victim impact statements, Michael's mother expressed that she no longer remembered what it was like to live without exhaustion or if it was possible to go a day without crying. She spoke of her daily torment over her son's terror in his final moments and questioned why she couldn't have been there to save him. Michael's girlfriend, in her turn to speak, shared that she lost the chance to form a family with Michael. Before passing the sentence, the judge addressed Glenn's role, stating that, had he survived, he would have also been tried for the crime. The judge emphasized that Glenn was a willing participant, not merely a deceived accomplice, and had engaged in the plan with some enthusiasm, perhaps believing it would win him Bianca's approval and affection. Highlighting the meticulous planning and cold execution of the plot, the judge sentenced Bianca Edmonds to 26 years in prison for the murder of Michael. She will be eligible for parole after serving 20 years. This woman, driven by a thirst for vengeance and capable of manipulating her husband with the promise of intimacy only when she felt happy, was responsible for the tragic loss of two lives. The long years she will spend behind bars should serve as a time for reflection. That's the end of today's case. Thank you for joining us on The Crime Storyteller. If you're interested in more intriguing true crime stories, especially from Latin America, be sure to check out our new channel, Latin Crimes. Click the link to subscribe and explore more mysteries with us. See you next time.